Okay, so these are my disclosures. Um, connectoplasm use is still off label, currently for acute ischemic stroke. <clears throat> So it is surprising um, and uh, you know, we always wonder struck by looking at the, this slide. Uh, it's almost hundred years um, since the first thrombolytic agent uh, was known to us, um, uh, to man. Uh, but it was since the late 1990s with the NINDS trials uh, that thrombolysis um, uh, took up uh, with patients with acute ischemic stroke. And since then, uh, there's been this constant effort uh, to help improve outcomes in patients with acute thrombolysis. Um, there have been trials with desmodiplase um, and of late uh, multiple trials with tenecteplase. Um, but I must, you know, this is the seminal paper, um, the meta-analysis on all the thrombolysis trials done with altiplase. And it went on to show how robust this drug was. Altiplase, uh, was helping all patients with acute ischemic stroke who would present early, including those who presented within three hours or those who would present uh, between three to 4.5 hours, the elderly and the not so elderly, uh, and those patients with minor strokes, zero to four, or those with uh, more severe strokes. And then this was the classic Emerson curve, uh, where we actually see that time is brain, that the earlier we treat patients, uh, the better it is. And this is the message for acute ischemic stroke patients. Now, we all know about altiplase, uh, uh, a friend of ours for the last 25 years. Tenecteplase is not really that different. Uh, it just differs on three protein moieties. Um, uh, but what it does is it makes that second generation thrombolytic tenecteplase more fibrin specific. It increases its thrombolytic potency. And interestingly, it potentially depletes less fibrinogen systemically, which then translates potentially into better recanalization and potentially into better safety. But in my opinion, it is primarily the way tenecteplase is administered, which is it is administered as a bolus over five to 10 seconds in comparison to altiplase that results in all the benefits with tenecteplase. And so it results in these enormous workflow benefits potentially, uh, including faster DDO times at primary stroke centers, less errors in dosing because it's just one dose, less use of infusion pumps, less need for IV access. And in the Canadian system, uh, it actually results in more efficient inter-hospital transfer with less use of ACLS versus the basic life support crew. And so those are potentially the advantages for tenecteplase. Now, tenecteplase has been known to us for almost, you know, uh, uh, more than 20 years now. And it was almost, um, I think, you know, like uh, 10 or 15 years ago that this trial came out uh, uh, in cardiology with patients with acute MI, the ASCEND 2 trial, which compared tenecteplase with um, altiplase. Now, um, just as a caveat, the dose was used by um, uh, the cardiologist for MI is really different from what we do. So tenecteplase was given at a dose of 0.5 milligram per kilogram and activase or altiplase was given at 1.1 milligram per kilogram. But as you can see, that was what they thought was an appropriate comparison. But in that large study, you can see that most outcomes were exactly similar. So 30-day mortality rates, the ICH rates, and the TNK uh, uh, versus uh, altiplase survival rates were exactly the same. There was a slight difference, I think, in peripheral bleeding, but overall, ASCEND2 showed the comparability of tenecteplase to uh, altiplase and resulted in a change in practice. Tenecteplase became standard of care for uh, patients uh, with acute MI when they were candidates for um, uh, fibrinolysis. Uh, now, in our field, um, and this was, um, I think, uh, you know, Sonia showed this, um, these slides uh, with, you know, this excellent piece of work that uh, you guys do at the European Stroke with your guidelines. And so this was the evidence up until say around 2020 or 2021 um, uh, with tenecteplase uh, versus altiplase in acute ischemic stroke patients. And you can see we had some phase two studies, but overall the number of patients and the strength of evidence uh, that is necessary for us to answer this question as to whether we can replace tenecteplase with altiplase in our practice was quite low and that reflected in your own recommendations. We 
wanted to address uh, this gap in evidence and we wanted to do it in a very pragmatic manner. We wanted to ask this question as to whether we can actually replace uh, tenecteplase with altiplase, uh, sorry, altiplase with tenecteplase in our practice, in our routine practice. And ACT was designed therefore to actually answer that question. It was based on the Canadian Stroke Best Practice Recommendation, CSBPR as we call it, which as I can see is really similar to the European Stroke Guidelines. Um, and so all patients would be eligible for thrombolysis, be eligible for the ACT trial. We managed to enroll around 1,600 patients across Canada. It was a non-inferiority design because it was really clear to us that if we show non-inferiority and robustly so, so if we show comparability, then because of its obvious advantages, uh, folks would just shift to tenecteplase. Uh, the trial had other uh, you know, unique elements, um, including its registry linkages, including its uh, use of technology. Um, but overall, ACT was actually able to show non-inferiority for tenecteplase versus altiplase. If you look at the results, you would see that, you know, it's the safety data, it's exactly the same. Uh, from an efficacy perspective, it was plus 2.6 in favor of tenecteplase with the confidence intervals, the lower margin, as um, uh, Sonia was showing, uh, uh, below three, was around uh, minus 2.6 percent for the delta. So this is the primary analysis. Uh, we call these the grotto bars in North America, but it's actually these are the rank and distribution. And this, uh, this was the um, uh, delta for the primary outcome, rank in zero one. Uh, was minus 2.6. And as Sonia showed you, uh, along with the phase two data, we can convincingly say for this outcome that these two drugs at least, you know, seem to be similar. The safety endpoints exactly the same. And I wanted to show you these slides. Remember, this was the slide I showed you from the Ascent um, uh, 2 trial of tenecteplase versus altiplase in patients with MI. And look at what we showed in ACT exactly the same. You can't actually distinguish tenecteplase versus altiplase for mortality. And so that was what we uh, showed in the ACT trial. That was almost at the same time that uh, the not s 2 trial came out, where it was preceded by the Extend IATNK part two uh, study that was asking this question about 0.25 tenecteplase versus 0.4 tenecteplase. And um, in the Extend IATNK2 study, you could see that the additional dose or the increased dose 0.4 was not really that dissimilar from 0.25. And then the not s 2 uh, study seems to suggest, if you just look at the raw data, that 0.4 might be uh, harmful. There were obviously baseline differences in uh, prognostic factors that might offer an explanation for why this is. But I think in the context of all that we know, and as Sonia showed in the EFO guidelines, the updated ones now, it is quite clear that uh, uh, the bus has passed 0.4, that we are not going there, that uh, the dose that our field would actually um, uh, move towards and is moving towards this 0.25 milligram per kilogram. And so now I come to what I think might actually be uh, the future uh, and what would happen next. Um, and so you will see other trials. Uh, you are going to see the TRACE2 trial uh, done from China, uh, which is asking the same question, tenecteplase um, versus altiplase. Um, and that is going to be published very soon. You will see the ATTEST2 trial, uh, Keith is here, uh, 1,800 subjects again, uh, late to 2023, uh, hopefully you know, in, in Canada. Uh, is when he'll present the results. And then you'll see probably the taste trial results, which is Mark Parsons study, 900 patients odd. And so substantial evidence uh, will build up um, to this comparison of tenecteplase versus altiplase. And this might all lead uh, in uh, the year 2024 to a pooling of all this data with around 7,000 subjects. And we would, you know, like with a high degree of confidence, be able to answer this question as to whether we uh, should actually be using tenecteplase, which I think we should. The Canadian guidelines just recently changed, as is uh, the European guidelines. But, you know, uh, for uh, 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 proponents of evidence-based medicine, and I am one, I think more evidence is always better. You would also start seeing... Uh, papers that report on tenecteplase in routine practice. Sonia just mentioned the Tetris registry uh, with incredible work that they are doing. 
uh, there would be you know data that comes from Europe. There would be data that comes from across the world. Some of these papers already published, and they would show um, routine practice intravenous tenecteplase uh, data. That would actually help um, us substantiate um, the evidence that we have from clinical trials. Uh, there is a pediatric population. Unfortunately, you know, like um, uh, it has always been the case that clinical trials are difficult in this population. Uh, but I'm hoping that as we move towards the use of tenecteplase in the adult population, they would start seeing case series and case reports um, on the use of tenecteplase in this population and would find that the drugs are really comparable. But more importantly, uh, you would actually start seeing more and more evidence for um, uh, the use, questioning the use, uh, of whether you can use tenecteplase in the late window. And so, so um, I think you already, you know, like trial results. And it was an interesting trial in the sense I was using pragmatic imaging. And overall, if you actually look at the rank and distribution and the raw numbers, uh, it does, uh, you know, suggest to promising results. But you will see, uh, hopefully this year, the timeless trial results, the eternal results. Um, these are from Australia the Chablis T2 trial, uh, which is Chinese, the TRACE 3 trial, again, Chinese, and the Brazilian trial, which is Brazil. Uh, I may have missed a couple of other trials, but the point I'm making is substantial evidence is going to accrue about the use of the nectiplase in the late time window. Now, we in Calgary, uh, my colleague Sheila Kutz leads this study, uh, which is TEMPO 2. Uh, now, uh, TEMPO 2 is uh, to test the use of the nectiplase in patients with minor strokes with non-disabling symptoms. Um, that trial is almost um, uh, finished um, uh, enrolling three-fourth of its projected sample size. But interestingly, it's also enrolls patients up until 12 hours uh, from uh, acute stroke onset using more pragmatic imaging, uh, mostly. Uh, and so that trial would uh, potentially substantiate the evidence, not just in minor strokes, but add to the evidence in the extended time window. Um, this is uh, something I, uh, you know, think is uh, a question for the future uh, that cardiologists, um, you know, like um, have been at, trying to answer the last many years. So this question about uh, what happens when we have two really robust treatments, so endovascular thrombectomy and, uh, and thrombolysis, uh, how do they interact with each other? Now, uh, these historically, uh, thrombolysis came first, and it was followed 15 years later by thrombectomy. And so we do not have trials that actually uh, fully understand how one might complement the other. Um, more recently, we have had bridging trials, uh, but bridging trials were, uh, in my opinion, at least with the exception of one or a couple of trials, um, were designed in a non-pragmatic manner because they would sort of restrict thrombolysis in um, um, the other arm, so the non-bridging arm. Uh, I feel like uh, the most obvious question to ask uh, potentially is bridging versus rescue therapy. And you know, like endovascular thrombectomy doesn't succeed often. And when it does so, it doesn't often succeed fully. And so uh, we should have all options open. In Calgary, uh, we think that thrombolysis and thrombectomy are complementary, uh, that they should support each other. And so more evidence um, uh, with tenecteplase, and there are no, no trials of this nature uh, up until now, uh, would actually be really helpful. Uh, I do think the advantages of a single bolus in a cat lab cannot be discounted. Uh, there's also this interesting uh, result that came from the CHOICE trial, which was um, a phase two trial about the use of altiplase post endovascular reperfusion and it potentially helping with microvascular perfusion. Now would the same apply with tenecteplase or more so? Uh, would we have more substantial evidence than a phase two trial like CHOICE? Uh, those are questions that are being answered with newer trials. Uh, and so I see the future of tenecteplase as across this spectrum from pre-hospital uh, to the emergency uh, to even in the cath lab that you might actually use thrombolysis across this spectrum. But we do need more evidence um, to actually build that case. There's also uh, this issue about balancing risk and uh, benefits uh, and uh, what I call therefore titrating dose. What do I mean by this? You know, we do give weight-based dose uh, for tenecteplase and for altiplase. Uh, a uh, person who weighs less would receive lesser uh, dose than a person who receives more. But that is the only titration we do. But what about other risk factors? Um, uh, what about other uh, signals? 
So what about the elderly? Uh, we do you know, know clearly that patients benefit from thrombolysis, but do, do, would they benefit from the same dose or would they benefit from uh, a slightly different dose? Uh, people who are on NOAX, this is increasingly an issue. People on new anticoagulant uh, agents um, uh, like um, rivaroxaban or apixaban or dabigatran, uh, uh, should they benefit from thrombolysis? Uh, prior antithrombotics, dual antiplatelets, you know, patients tend to be on these drugs when they come to us. Comorbidities like CKD, cancer, MCI, uh, diabetes, raised blood sugar, raised BP, Many uh, of the old Alteplas trials excluded some of these patients, and therefore we have this relative contraindication sometimes uh, for you know, certain indications. Uh, we can substantially build evidence um, in the future with an Alteplas for many of these issues. There's also this issue of key interest to me of permeable thrombi, where I think you know, like um, if this of thrombolysis will clearly dissolve clots. And so uh, uh, should we then, you know, consider titrating doses? Um, and so would we move towards a more personalized um, um, uh, regimen for thrombolysis or would we stick to a standard dose? Uh, that's an important question um, in our field. Uh, I've just, you know, this is a slide I made and you can see this table uh, with all these various conditions uh, where, you know, there's some uncertainty about, uh, you know, like, um, uh, uh, thrombolysis use, the guidelines may not actually encompass all of these patients. So this is, you know, really interesting and something that, you know, we could actually work on in the future. Connective place with concomitant therapies. Um, the most trial, the NIH funded most trial is trying to understand whether uh, giving eptifibatide and agatroban with intravenous thrombolysis in the acute period uh, could actually be more helpful than just intravenous thrombolysis. Uh, to me, that's a fascinating question. It's a question that, you know, uh, our friendly cardiologists would say, hmm, it makes sense, but we need more evidence um, uh, to suggest either to benefit or to harm. Uh, we know about neuroprotection, but how do these neuroprotectants, including, you know, the drug that we at Calgary are studying, Nerinitide, uh, through the ESCAPE NEXT trial, uh, whether that would actually interact with an active place um, and potentially help many of our patients, um, uh, possibly all the drip and shippers. Um, uh, there's also this question about lytic enhancers like DNA is one or Don is alpha and then other concomitant therapies. Um, uh, so there are lots of questions, as you can see, um, uh, in this new era with the next place. Um, and then there's this thing about how do we answer these questions? Would we go to our previous model? Maybe we would be doing multiple trials, and this might actually take us many, many years to answer many of these questions. Or would we adopt some of the advances that COVID has given us, including the whole concept of platform trials to answer multiple questions more efficiently, robustly, uh, at a global uh, scale uh, with lots of patients and sample sizes. Uh, so that's, you know, like uh, into a future. And so I will stop here by uh, quoting uh, the great American philosopher, Yogi Berra. Uh, you know, it's always tough to make predictions about the future, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and that, that statement itself has so many nuances. Um, uh, but Yogi's always been funny. Thank you.